everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening for Insight, Marlon James in conversation with Sherry Jones. My name is Leah. I'm from the Vancouver Public Library's programming and learning team. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that my home and the Vancouver Public Library are located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. This evening's Insight event is presented in partnership between the Vancouver Writers' Fest and the Vancouver Public Library. Before we get started this evening, I'd like to take the opportunity to share an upcoming library event with you. As part of Black History Month celebrations, we're hosting a conversation about issues of representation, equity, and diversity in sports. Join us online tomorrow, February 24th at noon for Changing the Game, a conversation with Black athletes. Rosie Ugoede, a multiple Olympic medalist and journalist, will moderate a discussion with Blake Bolden of the National Women's Hockey League, Troy Edwards, a fast rising hockey star, and also assistant coach Delroy Montague for the Valley West Giants U18 team. For more information on these and other events, you can visit us at vpl.ca slash events or by signing up for our email newsletter. And now please join me in a warm welcome for Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers Fest. Good evening and welcome to our third insight of 2022 presented in partnership with the Vancouver Public Library and TELUS. My name is Leslie Hertig and I'm the Artistic Director here at the Fest. We're so glad that you could join us this evening and thrilled to be presenting a conversation between two authors who are no strangers to the Vancouver Writers Fest. Booker Prize winning author Marlon James in conversation with Women's Prize nominee Sherry Jones. Before we begin, the Vancouver Writers Fest would like to acknowledge that we conduct our work here on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And we are very fortunate to be here, but cognizant of the work that needs to happen still as we move toward reconciliation and Indigenous sovereignty. I would like to take a moment to thank our event partners this evening, the Vancouver Public Library and TELUS, who make it possible for us to present events like this one free of charge. Thanks also to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, the BC Arts Council, the BC Government, the City of Vancouver and CMHC Granville Island. Thank you very much to all of you. And just a reminder that the Vancouver Writers Fest presents year round programming and updates on our events can always be found on our website. Mark your calendars for our insight events that happen every other Wednesday from now until the beginning of June. Coming up on March 9th will be a conversation between Sheila Hetty and Joshua Whitehead about Sheila's remarkable new book, Pure Color. And now on to our event. Our moderator tonight shot to literary fame with her 2021 debut novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House. Shortlisted for the prestigious Women's Prize, this novel captured the attention of numerous best of lists and was described by the Washington Post this way. Rare is the first book that reveals the writer fully formed, the muscles and sinews of her sentences firm and taut, the voice distinctly her own. But Sherry Jones's lavish cinematic debut, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, rises to that high bar. Sherry is joining us tonight from the Barbados. Our feature author this evening has a literary biography that just might be the dream of any writer working today. His novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, won the 2015 Man Booker Prize. It was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and won the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature for Fiction, among others. He's also the author of The Book of Night Women, which won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Minnesota Book Award, gaining him numerous other nominations along the way. His first novel, John Crow's Devil, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Book Prize for First Fiction and the Commonwealth Writers Prize, and was a New York Times editor's choice. When the first title in his Dark Star trilogy, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, was released, it was called gripping and action-packed and the literary equivalent of a marvel comic universe 
Now that book went on to win the LA Times Ray Bradbury Prize, as well as being a finalist for the National Book Award, among several others. And now Marlon returns with a stunning second novel in this trilogy, Moon Witch Spider King, a book that's been described by a reviewer at NPR as one of those novels that broke my brain, but in the best possible way, unwieldy and unrelenting. It systematically dismantled everything I thought I knew about epic fantasy. Which with the Dark Star trilogy, Marlon James has built a rich world brimming with African myths and legends, fantastical creatures and Tolkien-esque journeys. Please welcome Sherry Jones and Marlon James. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. And thank you, Marlon, for joining me. I am absolutely over the moon to be having this opportunity Aww. to interview you. So, Well, thank um, you so much. Getting... I'm such a fan of How the one Arm Sister Sweeps Her House. Oh, that are you? That was the first novel I read in 2021. Oh, so yeah. you, you yeah. set a very high standard for that year. A lot of novels didn't meet wow. it. Oh, wow. <laughs> thanks so much. That means the world. I'm going to watch this over and over just to hear you say that. I'm just letting you know. Um, I thought we could start with you just telling us a little bit about Moon Witch, Spider King, and then mm -hmm. maybe reading an extract for us. Mm -hmm. So if you could tell us a little bit, for those of us who are watching who might not have read um, read the book, what would you say the book is about? And if you could then read an extract for us. Sure. Well, the first thing for the person who has not read this book, um, read the, the previous novel, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, the first thing I would say is you can totally begin with this book. Um, the Black Star is a trilogy, Dark Star, funny actually, is, a, is the name of the trilogy. The first volume is Black Leopard, Red Wolf, as we mentioned before. And in that story, a character named The Tracker told the, gave testimony really about why on a mis mission to rescue a child, the child ended up dead and who was responsible. And one of the, 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 let's call them villains of Trekker's story was this character, Sogolum, who was called the Moon Witch. So for the second volume, um, I, you know, we ch change per perspective, change point of view to this so-called Moon Witch, this so-called villain, and what is her story. And her story ends up being very, very different from Tracker's. It goes without saying that Tracker doesn't come across well in her version, but in her version, what her basic argument is the story is even bigger than he could have thought it was. So the structure of the trilogy is three different characters telling the same, giving testimony. They're basically telling roughly the same story, but the stories aren't that similar at all. And because the three characters are telling the same story, because it's nonlinear, um, you can actually read it in any order. Um, for the person who's new coming to this book, I highly recommend reading Moonwish first, um, if for no reason to start a new war on Reddit, because there'll be the yeah. people who read Black Leopard <laughs> first and the people who read Moonwish first, and I can, yes. I can already see the war on Reddit. Right. <laughs> yes. So would you perhaps just read a, a short extract for us and then mm -hmm. maybe you can tell me why you chose that particular section to read? Sure. I, um, this is, it's a short section, but it needs a big setup. Um, you know, Sogolon, um, for those who may know her already, and for those who don't, um, you know, did a lot of exploits and she became involved in this mission and she was sort of betrayed and she ends up being seriously injured. And, um, in Black Leopard, Red Wolf, that's, that's the last to hear from her until she appears again near the end. In, in Moonwitch, we explore what happened after that injury when she was injured and abandoned and um, what exactly, tr what exactly tra you know, transpired. In this section, Sogolon, for the first time, is witnessing the impact of what she spent her, most of her life doing. She has saved a lot of people, um, also killed a lot of people, um, but she's never known the impact. And it's not till now when she is lying in her bed recuperating from some grievous injuries that she comes to terms with who she is and it's other people who tell her. So 
she's in the bed she's in the room in in the um, bedroom and women are attending to her um Then they mark white clay down my breast, down to the belly, and with wet fingers divide the clay into stripes. Another woman wrap rip leather around my hips. Every soul that look at you will see the woman you describe. That is how we all see you. But the enchantment won't deceive any kind of mirror, not glass, not iron or copper, nor the puddle, nor the river. Nothing that woman used to look at your face. This is how everybody will see you but you will never see yourself. More women come into the room as it get lighter and still more women, or perhaps I was seeing them for the first time. You don't remember me, one of them say. She wear a band around the eyes that her husband take away from her. After you write the wrong done to me, the woman teach me how to see with my fingers, my ears and my nose, she say, as she paint clay on my skin with grace. After my father killed my mother, he tech to me, said another. The night you come, he was heading to my sister's bed. You don't know me, for then I was no woman, say yet another. I call each of these women my sisters since then. You remember us? The girls kidnapped in that caravan headed to Marabanga. They were taking us out to sea to sell us off as wife and concubines. We were seven and eight. Each night, they take away one of us to test the goods, and that girl would never return. That night you swooped down on my roof was a night I know the gods didn't forget us. Every woman in this room touched by the moon witch stepped forward, the Nim Nim woman said. And every woman in the room looked at me and approached the bed and surround it. They take their time and let the quiet shuffle do the talking. Some look like faces I supposed to remember. Some look like faces I used to know. Many of them old. Some of them older than the child they was when they first see the moon witch. Woman with gele of the east on her head. Woman with the igia of the south on her. Woman in white like nuns. Woman in rainbow like queens. Mother and daughter and sister and woman with no one. Woman with one eye, one ear, one leg, no legs. Woman, other women holding up. Woman from the top of Mantha and from the bottom of Marabanga. Ghosts of women who come back from the other world to see the moon witch and a crabby one who said, why should it love that silver? Some would mouth back to the brim with words waiting to explode. Some nodding quietly, their eyes saying, we see you, sister. Woman who steal a touch of my shoulder, forehead. Woman who grab my hand until another pull my hand into theirs. They pack the room right up to the doorway and still more was outside, waiting to squeeze themselves in. A girl warm her way through them to touch me and say, they couldn't move my mother, so she sent me. Moon is still flying through the trees, say another. Now plenty women out there writing the wrongs. Plenty in the north and south saying, Moon Witch, she is me. Oh my gosh, that is beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. So Marlon, you have this podcast series called Marlon and Jake Read Dead People with your editor, um, Jake Morrissey. And when asked if there was any book you wish another author had written, you said almost any book about a woman written by a man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And here now we have Moon Witch Spider King. (laughs) Written by Marlon James and featuring the amazing badass Sogolan. Now, you said none of the great male authors ever pulled off a real woman. In Sogolan, have you managed to do what, you know, you said none of the great male authors have done in pulling off and painting for us a real woman? Um. Man, I'm, I must have been speaking some fighting words that day. I'm surprised uh, my house has uh, surprised my house wasn't bombed or burned down. I, you yeah. know, I mean, I will qualify it by you know saying a lot of what we consider the great male writers, you know, mm-hmm. the mailers and the updikes, mm-hmm. and you know, even the even the greater writers like Marquez and so on. And I didn't say it, but the one of the, one of the big fights that happened in, in Latin American literature was when Jose Donoso, the great Chilean author, said the one failure of all of us is as none of us pulled off a woman. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's um and 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 I think the thing the the, the problem when men write women is the same problem sometimes when white write black or when male write female or maybe vice versa. And that's not to say we shouldn't. We should always write what we consider the other. We should always write people who are not us. Writing is an act of empathy, and and that's the, the, it's not a matter of should. But it is a matter of, are we doing the work? Um, for me, Sogolan, I tried to. It's not the first female protagonist I've written. Um, and I remember all this stuff, you know, I, my, my, the greatest teacher for me for writing women have been women writers. Um, you know, Toni Morrison remains my teacher, even though I've never met her. Um, and the question, you know, and, and I, you know, make sure my characters have complication and, con- and, and and contradiction, not not hypocrisy, contradiction, and that they um, don't they don't leave a novel the way they enter it. Um, so I, I hope so. I don't I don't know if I was fully one hundred percent successful because I don't think any novel is one hundred percent successful. Um, and ultimately, Sogolin is is you know is in a fantasy universe, playing by rules that are not the rules we necessarily play by now. So I hope so. I certainly did the best I think I could do, and um, and hopefully that that you know that's 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 better better than than you know better than what we find sometimes, which is instead of embodying characters, what we do is just project our fears and desires and them, and then react to them. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Well, I think you did an amazing job. I was really, really moved by um, Soglin's character and some of the, mm. the trials and the tests she goes through and how she triumphs. I really identified it. And, you know, it's, mm. a, it's an alternate world, but I really felt that it resonated with some of my experiences and I'm really thankful mm-hmm. for that. Thank um, you. In sort of, you're welcome. In sort of, you know, reading the book, I got elements of some of my favorite Caribbean female writers. So, you know, I read and I thought about Jamaica Kincaid. I thought about, especially her short story, um, Mm -hmm. Girl. I thought about Olive Senior. There was some Mm -hmm. just way that you wrote. And I wondered whether you were influenced by any female Caribbean writers. If so, who they might be. Oh, my Um, God. I I mean, the first time I met Olive Senior, I had to, like, confess... I'm like, okay, you got to understand, I've been ripping you off for so long. I, you know, you um, really I'm Summer Lightning. I, I said, I told her, Summer yes. Lightning, Summer Lightning yes. taught me how to write fiction. Yes, yes. I, I you know, I'm, I've been reading tons of books, yes. but I never realized, oh, wait, we can write about this. Yes. And we yes. can write about it in yes. that way. And I, I mean, there are few stories that have ever left me dead in my tracks, that country of the one I got. Yes, yes. Um, you know, so lots of other senior, loads and loads and loads of Erna Bradbar. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Michelle Cliff. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Patricia Powell. Uh, Velma Trial. Pollard. Yes. Yeah, yes. you know, yeah. um, the Dan Trevor, also the Pagoda. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, uh, who else was I been reading? Um, you know, because it's not just it's not just a, it's not just a, the the novelists and the prose writers. It's also you know it's also um um why am I blanking on her? She's gonna be furious that I forgot her name. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the. Oh my god, why am I blanking? Anyway, it will come to me because I'm trying to remember also the the, the the you know the poets as well. But also, yeah. you know, going further back, you know, um, Claude McKay. Yes. You know, yes. who is, you know, a male know. author, but, you know, yes. the, the Caribbean, the Caribbean four beers. But yeah, I, I you know, a lot of, of my sens- sensibility, even writing a novel that's about Caribbean, African, African folklore, it's still, te- still, you know, Caribbean writers will recognize the Caribbean-ness. Yes, because that's that's something that I found in reading, you know, the narrative to me, the, the cadence, it was just Caribbean. I mean, it was, you know, how you sort of 
delivered that voice was to mm. me it was it was Caribbean even though it was yeah. you know African mythology yeah. was that delivered well, um not necessarily I think I can't help being that but I also you know was hugely influenced by by pigeon mm-hmm. and pigeon is very similar to Pata we still play by the yes. same roles in pigeon you yes. also don't say the books you said the book them yeah yeah and yeah. and and uh, you know the way in which we still use these words like we'd say you know you don't say is is you know plenty of people say just yeah man just spare us of people outside mm-hmm. that's very pigeon people pigeon in pigeon you say it as well sus of the mean mm-hmm. plenty yeah you know mm-hmm. pure sus of book out there mm-hmm. um so so it was still hugely inspired by pigeon i think um like um, one of the difference between pigeon and patois is pigeon still uses a lot of to be verbs. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we, 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 you know, pigeon still said the rain is falling. Mm-hmm. Whereas mm-hmm. he said the rain falling. The rain falling. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. But yeah, it's still very much inspired by it because one of the things that um, studying African languages mm-hmm. and studying is a stress, reading a lot African languages is even when I didn't learn the vocabulary, I learned the rules. Mm-hmm. And uh, you learn when you're in the Caribbean, you are kind of taught that the voice coming out of your mouth is a broken language. Yes. yes. That is broken English. And it's not broken English. It's English playing by different rules. Yes. Um, and by wall of rules of grammar, verbs are always present tense. Yes. We bring that to, to a pattern and we think, oh, it must be backward English because we, we don't say when to say him did go. Yeah. But that's very well off. You know, that's very, that's very uh, West African that an action is always active. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he did go, him soon go, him won't go, him can go, even he going go. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it, it was, and there was research that did this, that, that um, it actually brought me a whole new pride in my Jamaican voice, mm-hmm. you know, writing his African books. So I think some of that comes out. A lot of that comes out in it in the prose. Yeah, there's definitely that connection. So maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about the research you did, um, mm-hmm. you know, for the book. How did you go about, you know, finding out as much as you relay about African music mm-hmm. and folklore? What was that process like? Well, the process was really organic because the research came before the book. Yeah, <laughs> that helps. You know, um, there's a picture of. I think it's on Facebook still, of um, the day I got the first copy of Brief History of Seven Killings. So we're talking, we're, we're talking like August 2014. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and that book is right above a stack of books on African religious ceremonies. So I was researching this book from before Brief History came out. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, in two no. years I'd have spent, sorry? Did you know you were researching it? Had you no, I didn't know I was researching a book. book was it? Yeah. Not at all. I, I was researching for the, just for knowing because, mm-hmm. you know, when you grow up in any form of this di- African diaspora, you're sometimes thought that ground zero for you as a people is slavery. Yes. Yes. Um, and we learn a little African history, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and we learn African history, and, but we don't know African mythology. We don't know African religious upbringing. And I talk about this a lot, funny enough, to a lot of Europeans about what it is like to take your mythology for granted. And that if you're British or you're Swedish, you can take your, you can take Thor for granted because Thor is always there. You know, you can take Robin Hood for granted. You can take King Arthur for granted because King Arthur is, uh, was always there. And King Arthur still helps shape a certain idea of Britishness. Mm-hmm. You come to the Caribbean... I don't know. I didn't know Queen Ninjinga. Yeah, there's just a gap. Right. You know, I don't, I don't, I mean, I know Shango because I know I have friends who worship Shango, but I didn't know Shango. I don't know Yamaya. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know Mami Water because we have River Mumma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know some folklore, but the mythology, which to me, I'm sure I'm going to write a paper about this one day. To me, the mythology is like the instinctual history of a people. Yes. Mythology was religion one time, you know, mm-hmm. and, mytho- and before that it was fact. And I think I lost something or never gained something by not having that. So that's what I did. I went, that's what I went looking for. 
mm-hmm. is in reading some of this stuff. I'm at, man, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this stuff, I started to think, man, there's a yeah. book here. There's a, there's yeah. a universe here. Yeah. And I'll never yeah. be able to capture all of it. But I knew I'm going to do it. But that's why it happened. The, the book came out of research, not the other way around. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what was the process of writing this particular mm-hmm. story, like Moon Witch, Spider King? How you know mm-hmm. how long did it take? Where were you, and what was the process mm-hmm. like? So, so Moon Witch, Spider King is the second fastest book I've ever written. Really? <laughs> yeah, the, the fastest book I've ever written was was. Um, was my second novel, The Book of Night Women. Of Night Women. Oh, I love that book. I have bones yeah. to pick with you. Not even a bone to pick with you, but bones <laughs> to pick with you about The Book of Night Women. But I won't do it now. But yes. yes. So, so that book I wrote in around 16 months, 16, 17 yeah. months. And the reason why it was so quick is that I had to, I had to, I had to write it to graduate. Yes. So yeah. um, this yeah, book took 18 months. And the reason why, I think the reason why is because of COVID, honestly. It was my COVID novel. I started mm-hmm. writing it in March 2020 at, when this plague just exploded on us. Mm-hmm. And I was in the middle of, you know, rural Connecticut at my partner's sister's dining room table. And I started writing this, this novel. And... um you know, in terms of process, one, 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 I was in a highly concentrated thing, so I could write a lot, but I also had to trick myself into forgetting the first book because if I had not, all I would have written is a rebuttal. A reply. The first yes. one. Yes, of course. And she's not, and so on, like, but who's this fool that I need to reply that. to him? Yes. Yes. And, you know, we've read, we, we hopefully have read Black Leopard Red Wolf or we know of it. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't. Mm-hmm. So it's different. If 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 I want to interview two people because I want to get to the nitty gritty of what happened, mm-hmm. I can tell you what the other person said and you respond or I can keep quiet and see what you say. Yes. So that's what I had to do. I had to sort of shut my mouth and forget everything I heard, pretend I never, never wrote Black Leopard and write this. And, and on one hand, I still have to pay attention to the person who has read Black Leopard and doesn't want to go through the tedium of reading the same book twice. But I also had to remember, one, there are readers who will read this book first, but even more so, because I don't really think about readers that much when I'm writing, mm-hmm. is to remember that her testimony is from her. Mm-hmm. And it's about her. And I had to, even stuff that are important, even a scene that's crucial to track her is nothing to struggle on. And a scene that has layers for her, he Mm -hmm. glazes over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had to remember all of that. And then that's how I sat down, I sat down to write by forgetting the previous book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I mean, how did that process differ? Because for me, I mean, I, I say that, you know, my process or how I get inspired to write a story is almost as if a story kind of falls on me. It's a separate mm-hmm. thing and I'm in service to it. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I get into that world and I'm bringing whatever I can bring to telling that story, but it's not my story in that sense. Mm-hmm. It's something separate and apart from me. Mm-hmm. What is that process like for you? How are you inspired? And, and was there yeah. a difference with Moon Witch? I agree with you. I agree with everything you said. I, I, you know, I tell my students all the time: you don't create stories; you find them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to me, when I when I stumble upon a character, and a lot of times it's a stumble, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're already in their story. Mm-hmm. They've already moved ahead. They've already, they, you know, I usually catch my characters way past the point where I end up starting writing about them. Yeah. Um, and as a result, almost every novel I write, the first page you read is not the first page I wrote. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I wrote for Moon Witch is on, I think, page 384. Right. Wow. Because as I said, when I catch my characters, they're busy doing their thing and don't give a damn about me. Yes. So I, I you know, when I, yeah, so when I started writing Spat Moon Witch, Sugarland was already on this boat heading towards the south and caught in a, what seems like it's going to be a shipwreck. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I am like, hold up, hold up, hold up. But how did you get here? How did you get? Yes. 
And that's the process, isn't mm-hmm. it? It's like you land there mm-hmm. and it's kind of like, but hang on, y'all going on and y'all living and stuff, but I want to find mm-hmm. out how we get here, how we how get, we get here. Yeah. This is why I wish, you know, you know, for, for, for the, the beginning writers who are going to be watching this, who always struggle, I don't know how to swear to begin. Mm-hmm. And I was like, just begin. Yeah. We'll you don't have to begin at the yeah. beginning. The book, the yes. book will tell you. Yeah. The book will tell yeah. you if it's the beginning. And yeah. sometimes, if you're lucky, you get to keep that part. Yeah. I've been lucky and unlucky because I've have lots of pages on the cutting room floor that didn't fit. And the book will tell you what's the beginning. You know, mm-hmm. the book will tell you. Um, and, and that's always been the case with me. I've never started a book at the beginning. I don't know. God bless people who can do it. Them, big, them, better, them, better, them better than me, boy. Because I stumble, uh. I fumble, I go through characters, I start, I fail. My record is 500 pages that I couldn't use. 500 pages for one Because one I didn't want to quit. You know, like in a really, really oh, bad God. relationship, but you don't want to quit because then you need no relationship. <laughs> And I, <laughs> right, and something is better than nothing, or or something yeah, is better. Is not, something is which, better than something bad, which is not true. But we still do it. Yeah. Um, you yes. know, the point being that for me, it's it's um, I write towards figuring out what I want to write, and I've never yes. found a better way of doing. It. I'm sure there are better ways, but man, I don't know none. It's right. it's you, yeah, you 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 spend the pages and you write the pages until you know you're there. And sometimes the there is a real beginning. So this is a thing because, you know, this book is described as an epic fantasy and it's over. I mean, it's a lot of pages, you know, on my I got a PDF version. It's over 600 um, pages. And in this same, you know, Marlon and Jake read dead people. You talked about like liking to um, read plays because they're mm-hmm. short. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm well, he yeah. likes to read things that are short, which, you know, as a I, yeah. I write short stories as well. And, you know, I can mm-hmm appreciate that but your books are so rich and so you know so intricately woven and so you know mm. and and long you know funny enough it was a short story writer that in, in, inspired me inspired me to write long and it's not like she writes she writes long stories too but alice monroe alice monroe and, yes, yes but not in a sense alice monroe didn't inspire me in terms of story length because then i'd have written short stories Alice Munro inspired me because almost something about Alice Munro's stories is that where everybody else would end theirs, she continues. Yeah. And yeah. she's really interested in the afterlife of her characters. And yeah. that made me become very interested in the afterlife of my characters. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that would mean 600 pages, though. <laughs> I thought that would mean, okay, yeah. so then I'll write 30 <laughs> more pages or so on. Um, but but yeah, at least one is to be blamed. That, right. <laughs> because I, I, I learned the I learned the interesting afterlives that she have. I didn't learn the brevity. Um, right. but you know, I, you know, when I write a novel or when I write anything, I enter a room, I immediately want to know everything about it. Mm-hmm. I want to know the history, I want to know the architecture, I want to know why brick here, but you know, Marta there. Um, mm-hmm. Who are the last people in here, and so on? And I, and I, you know, and my characters spend a lot of time just being present mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. in their stories. And for me, me putting somebody, making somebody present in a story takes a while for me, mm-hmm. and I, I because I'm interested in everything. I think it's great though because it it allows us, I mean, who are reading to to really enter into that world. I think it's easier because of the way that you do it. It's per- perhaps a little harder um, with the writer who reads a lot of other spaces. So there was another comment that you that you made. I um, listened to this um, interview and you said some dead authors' lives are really fascinating and they're books or not i wanted to find out <laughs> is your life <laughs> more fascinating than the stories you create is who's at mine 
say your life. Yeah, it's your life. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely but not. I'm I, I keep going, oh my God, my biographer is going to have such an awful time re- writing about this boring dude. <laughs> I was like, that's if I even have a biographer. I was like, right. um, no, I, you know, I, I get my tea because as much as I scream about colonialism, I do love my tea. In fact, right. I'm just, I was you literally now, just yeah. having tea <laughs> with my little tea bag sticking out. Right. <laughs> but I, no, I, I, I love routine. Um, I, I write like, I, I mean, I have a work day. I get up, I, I, you know, I go to work. Um, I sit down and I write for, you know, from like 10, 11 to like 6 PM. Um, I would love to say that means actual writing, but sometimes that means staring at a screen going, what the hell am I going to do today? Uh-huh. And before you know it is evening I go, okay, I guess that's the writing day. <laughs> um, right. but i yeah i um i i love drama on the page and and i and i you know it's 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 i talk about teaching a lot but one of the challenges i have with my students is they're afraid of drama mm. um, i think because they don't want drama in their own lives i'm like i love getting my characters into awful trouble yeah I've seen how testing you they, don't have how, and, yeah, <laughs> and how they figured a way out of it because I think there's yeah. something uh, something very very human about okay. figuring yeah. our way out of difficult situations. We're the only animal that does that, yeah. Um, yeah. and you know it's it's it's. I think there's a huge part of what makes us human. I think that's something. I think you know when a writer writes and is inspired to write, I think what they're really saying is, I've figured out the part of what makes humans human that I want to write about. Mm. And it's not always a nice thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be jealousy. It can be violence. It can be you know. Um, relationships that fray or so on. But when I think that for me um, is what makes me, you know, makes me want to write. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because for me, a big part of my writing process is trying to figure things out. It's almost mm. as if that's the working out of it for me, you know, working mm. out things. It's just writing on the page that somehow helps me to process. And depending on the issue, it can be very healing. Um, but does that, was that, a- does that, I'm, I'm, I'm hijacking to ask you a question because I got me some questions about <laughs> your book. So does that, does that apply to, because, you know, the, one of the things I love about the, about the novel is, you know, how, how, um, you really get into, so I, I really, my prefer, preference is that I, I'm very, I'm always very concerned about how people write, let's call them bad Violent. people. Not yes. bad people, valiant yes. people, evil yes. characters, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, in my class, they know a hard rule. You do not get to use mental illness to do that. That's, I don't have a lot of rules. Like, That's one rule of in my class. But mm-hmm. Aidan, I saw the evolution of who he, he's essentially a psychopath in a way. <laughs> and yeah. I'm very curious yeah. about the, the ever how, how, how did he evolve? And is there, are there any parts where he started? Is it Aidan or Adam? It's Aiden. Yes. Did you ever get to the part where Aiden started to scare you? Um, I I don't think, you know, there were things that he did that I found scary, but I think Mm -hmm. from the beginning, I appreciated Aiden as a human being and therefore a complex person. And based on my own beliefs, I just felt Mm -hmm. when we met him, he was perhaps more what people would call bad than good. Mm -hmm. But he didn't he didn't scare me. It was difficult to write about some of the things he did at at Mm -hmm. points. didn't scare me. I think the first character I came across um, that changed my my world and my writing, my life and my writing, um, was Bola. 
Hospital in the Wine of Astonishment by Earl Lovelace. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I remember and that. I never, <laughs> I never wrote a villain the same again after that. Mm-hmm. It was just like a, it was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and it's yeah. been true to life in terms of as I grew and I, I yeah. observed people. So, yeah. later, on, yeah. later on, we're going to have an argument about whether he's a hero of the novel or not. Okay, I got some opinions. <laughs> this, well, this is what I'm saying, and we still got to talk about the Book of Night Women, so so this is going to be a conversation after. Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to ask you, I mean, every novel that you've written so far has been highly acclaimed, you know, very successful, you know, great reviews, critical reviews. Do you ever write when, you know, when you were writing Moon Witch, Spider King, did you ever get even an inkling of, you know, I wonder if this one is going to be as well received as the others? Does oh, that I ever get happen? that with every book. Every yeah? book, I think, man, this is the one that's going to fail. This is, <laughs> one that's gonna, this, is the one, this is the one that's going to crash and burn. This right. is the one that's going to up. I am so bad at giving reassuring advice to writers. Are because they're like, if you get to the point where it's comfortable, I'm like, oh man, no, I still, I remember somebody was talking about how in a certain climate, because of a certain climate of, I guess, cultural appropriation, blah, 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 representation, they feel afraid to approach the text, that afraid to approach their, the, 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 the laptop, the, pa- the, the page. And I'm like, mm-hmm. hold on, you're not scared? Yeah. I'm shaking my boots every time I pick up a book. I, I'm like, how do people do this? I am going to crash and burn. I am terrified when really? I start writing a book and I, and I never get over that fear um, I think I, I tell myself that either I'm brave enough or stupid enough to keep doing it even though I'm scared mm. um, and at times when I really do I do fall for these characters mm. and I become more interested and my interest in them overshadows my fears about whether I'm writing well yes, yes, or, yeah. or, or so on and I think after a while, you just have to get to the point where you're just thinking this is the best you can do at the time. Like I'm yes. doing my, you know, my best work. And and of course, post writing books, you can read reviews and 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 reviews can be great. Um, negative reviews can sometimes be instructive, but negative re- negative reviews can sometimes simply be wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they're and, reviews. Yeah. But I, I um, the doubt doesn't leave, but I think it's not, for me, it's not crippling. It doesn't stop me from writing. Mm-hmm. Being scared of something has never stopped me from doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, honestly, I don't want to approach writing with confidence, mm-hmm. honestly. I want to approach with some nerves. I want to approach with some, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, I want to approach with, um, honestly, I think it also, it's, a, I think it, it's, it, it's it's for me it's humbling and i think you yeah. do have to approach writing with humility there's like an you implied know. respect there it's like if mm-hmm. you're you know you're not overconfident and complacent you know it's, you approach it with reverence and respect and and it shows mm-hmm. you know in what you come up with so mm-hmm. can you tell me about the one manuscript um the one piece of writing whatever it was that you did that never made it out into the world um that you (laughs) think is fantastic some great wonderful project um what would it be and what was it about oh man i mean i i don't know if i have one of those i mean for a long time that was my first novel Mm. you know for a long time it was a book I felt very confident about a book I felt was the best thing I could write at the time and a book that had some things that I wanted to say and um, I mean it's an old story you know that um, pretty much every publisher turned it down Mm -hmm. Um, every publisher I read that yeah pretty much every publisher um, you know rejected it um and it, for a long time that was the book because it was i did shelve it i did forget it in fact i forgot being a writer i just i i gave up um you know it's it's you know the question that begs asking can can 78 people be wrong can 100 people be wrong and you're right 
Actually, yeah. Yeah, actually. Um, it doesn't mean these people aren't smart. That doesn't mean these people sometimes don't have really interesting things to say. And it doesn't mean that some of their criticisms weren't valid. Mm-hmm. But people came around. This is, a, you know, this is still an industry and, and, and it can be sometimes a very short-sighted one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it can sometimes have a very narrow idea as to what, what is a successful book. By the rules of 2000 and, you know, by the rules of 2002, 3, 4, 5, even 2010, I am not supposed to be a successful author. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, by the rules of some publishing thing, best-selling books don't look like mine. They don't mm-hmm. sound like mine. They don't have those kind of words and they don't have those kind of scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, though, one thing I, even back then when I couldn't get published, I don't think I ever mm-hmm. underestimated the book reader. Mm-hmm. You know, I have my strong opinions about book publishers, but I never, I never, I never doubt, doubted the reader themselves. And it was just about then getting past the publisher to the, you know, to the readers with your work. Was it? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, I think it's, we've come a long way and I've been in this industry long enough to see how long we've come. We've come a long way, you know, with writers such as yourself. Uh, uh, and so on, telling stories that owe an allegiance to nothing but the story yes. itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's there was a time where a story written in the language of yeah. of you know of how the one arm sister sweeps house wouldn't have yeah. been picked up by a, a major publisher. Yeah. It just wouldn't have been. And I think um, we are. It's not just that we're broadening the scope of what is accepted from a no, expected from a novel. We're broadening the scope of what a novel should sound like, like. and what it should read like. And, and, you know, the good news is I think the audience, the readership is along for the ride. I do think the reader got there before the publisher did. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Um, tell me a little bit about, I don't know if you can, the third book in the trilogy. Well, the third book is a super top secret. Not even my All right. editor, <laughs> not even my Agent knows who's going to tell the third, yeah, tell no. the third no. book. So I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't betray the secrets. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So um, is there anything else that you are working on um, right well, now? Well, I'm, I'm kind of going branching into different media, into different media where you know, I'm working on a TV show, um, a detective series called Get Millie Black. Sort of oh. based like Get Christy Love and Get Carter, those seventies sort of black exploitation films. Right. And it's a detective show that's coming out hopefully in twenty twenty three, and it's been done with Channel Four and with HBO. And wow. it's original story; it's not adapted from anything, and it's a detective series with a you know explosive black female lead. Um, there I go writing these women again. I was just gonna um, say, I was just <laughs> about to say that, yes. <laughs> and and yeah, it's been a lot of fun and super super challenging to write in a different medium. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm also that's also you know what I'm working on, and, and it's coming really soon. Okay, so how are you different now? I mean, having written Moon Witch, Spider King. How is that different? How are you different as a writer? How has you how have you evolved from say the book of night women? I think I have a a wider and maybe what I'm looking mean is freer idea of what a novel should be and what a novel should say and how it should say it. Even with with Book of Night Woman, I still was, you know, in my mind anyway, nobody else is in my mind. I think I was still writing a sort of a classicist idea of a novel. Yeah. And it's a very, it's a, it's, it's, it's a tight novel for one of a, one of a better word. Um, whereas, you know, Brief History is, is, is sort of a loose baggy monster. And I've been mean, <laughs> writing kind of loose and baggy since. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, but um, um, I forgot the original question. Yeah, how how is you as a writer? How you, right, but yeah, I, how I, you- I I think I think um, for me, I have stopped writing with my own sort of predetermined expectations as to what a novel should be. 
and what what how you should say and how you should say it. Um, because for a long time, even with Book of Night Woman, I was still going by an idea of what a book should be. And I don't think a book should be anything. I think, you know, a book should go wherever you feel led to take it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I read the Book of Night Women, I haven't read um, your first novel, but I read the Book of Night Women and I read A Brief History of Seven Killings, which I found um, tough to get into, but riveting once I was in it. You know, mm-hmm. it was kind of like it was a it was like that slow start and then you're in there and you just can't get out. And I really, really mm-hmm appreciated that you know I really I really loved that but you know had I had I kind of stopped there I don't think I could ever have imagined um that we would get to Moon Witch Spider King and it it's Mm -hmm. like I think I probably you know had this 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 um, notion in my head of you as a writer and a writer of a particular type of book. So it's interesting that you would say, you know, you've passed the point of having an idea of what a novel should be and just gone into, you know, just, just, just writing um, for writing's sake, for the, for the sake of the story. Um, Mm -hmm. But how would you respond to people who say, you know, you've gone from, the sort of literary novel into, you know, sort of the, you know, fantasy sort of mm-hmm. genre type type novel. What would you? Um, well, I mean, I never, I don't, honestly, I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is a, a certain sort of genre snobbery that sometimes these people, yeah. these people have. As if the, the the literary novel, whatever that is, is some sort of superior form, mm-hmm. um, and I've always found this funny, um, you know, because I read a lot of social realist novels, and one and and we, we started out talking about men who can't write women, you know, I read a lot of novels with some very mediocre men who mm-hmm. in probably have a wife and two mistresses, mm-hmm. as I, and you think I am writing fantasy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um all fiction is I mean Lord knows all fiction is by the nature speculative, that's why we call it fiction. Yes. Yeah. Um but I think you know we lose something when we start to rank literature. First, we're forget- forgetting that the first stories were the folk tales, were the mythologies, were the fairy tales, were the fantastical stories, those were the first stories we had that whenever we as a people, as humans, honestly, are try, try to explain the really big questions, we reach for mythology, we reach for religion. Why did that hurricane come down and destroy all of this? We, we go back to these primordial stories to try to explain ourselves. And we've always done it. It's one thing every, every race, every creed, everybody is having in common, that when we want the big questions, we reach for the mythological so this this type of storytelling has been a crucial aspect of our humanity forever. This recent, and it's pretty recent, ranking of it, I think, is ridiculous. I think we think once somebody starts to show magic, we think it's child's play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's not. really, oh, no. it's never been the case. Also, for me personally, strange stuff happens in all my novels. Um, Brief History is, I guess, the closest I've written to a social realist novel, but one of the main characters is a ghost. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, yeah, so I have even then I've always sort of messed with this idea of 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 reality and realism, yeah. and even the idea of what's to be expected from a literary novel. I'm sure there are people on the other side who might think the 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 fantasy novels I've written are too literary for them. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. you know, the people who really think or really think they're, they're about to buy an African Game of Thrones uh-huh. and pick it up and go, this ain't no, well, what the hell is this? This ain't, this ain't, this ain't, this ain't, no, this ain't no Game of Thrones. Where, where's the magic? Where's the great battle? Yeah. Where, where yeah. you know, where's the battle scene? Mm-hmm. Where are the kings and blah, blah, blah. So. So I did read, um, I did read that comment that you sort of, you know, 
described it almost as an African Game of Thrones. Do you watch a lot of television? What's your favorite? Um, what are your favorite TV programs? My favorite TV. So I. So of course we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I'm watching a lot of escapist programming. Mm-hmm. So I was really into Ozark. Wow. Yes. So Ozark is a show that you're really riveted as long as you do not pause to go. This don't make any damn sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah. long as you, you don't pause to say that. Um, so I've been really, really, really like, really digging that show. Um, what else have I been watching that I really like? There's this French series called Into the Night. I'm all about genre. So in, in, um, in Into the Night, the apocalypse has happened. The sun has decided to destroy all of us. Um, these would be this French, French plane, French passenger, passengers are trapped on a flight and they literally have to outfly the sun in order to stay alive. And that's how they keep circling the globe, trying to beat the sun. Wow. Stay that's alive. It's, it's complete escapist entertainment and I am totally here for it. Um, other than that, I May Destroy You, Michaela Cole's series, I thought was in some ways the best novel of 2020, mm-hmm. 2021. I thought it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And I was, mm-hmm. there are times I'd watch an episode and go, man, I may destroy you is destroying me. <laughs> <laughs> why? Destroying you, why? Why? Um, because of the gut truths in it, because of the realities that's in it, because of the ways in which she comes to storytelling and the way she drops these really devastating truths about, you know, just about her life and about memory and about trauma and about what was done to the character, which I don't want to spoil if somebody hasn't seen it, but we we really have never seen anything like this on TV before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my kind of last question, is there anybody um, in your family, in your close circle, who you might allow to read your stories before your editor or anybody else sees them? Um, I mean, value and why? I, 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 I want, I beg every time. I tell you, if, if there's one thing that keeps me in check is that my family remains constantly unimpressed by me. <laughs> I um, identify. I totally identify. You know, I have one friend who who used to read read my stuff, and I loved it because he was a really scientific person, and he didn't he, he didn't know things like character and theme and place. He he'd be like this part this this part is boring, and this part uh, is yeah. okay, and I yeah. like her here, but I don't like her there, and yeah. this part was okay yeah. again, and I didn't yeah. read that part. It looked like it was gonna be stupid, and yeah. he keeps getting. I don't know why he keeps asking me to read. I'm like, dude, you're the perfect reader. Right, right. That's exactly what I want to hear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Does your partner read your read early drafts? Oh my God, no! <laughs> I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't read his either. We 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 we, we circle each other's <laughs> stuff every now and then. Every now and then I'll get a taste, and like, and I think, man, thank God he's good, because I don't know what I'd do if he wasn't. <laughs> So has he read Moonwitch Spider King and what's his assessment? He has not read Moonwitch Spider King. He has read the book of Nightwoman. Right. And and no 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 the whole thing is but will you read something as good as this? I'm like, "Oh lord, here we go." <laughs> so the book of Nightwoman he loved. Mhm. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Um, Thank you so much, Marlon. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think an hour has just about flown. Um, I can't I can't tell you how how much this means to me to have had the opportunity to have this conversation. Moonwitch Spider King Mm. is a fantastic novel and I'm just so happy. that have had the opportunity to talk to you about it. So thank you. And I'm going to turn over to Leslie now. Thank you as well. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you. Oh, Sherry and Marlon, that was a great pleasure. I, I have 
thoroughly enjoyed this past hour. Thank you both so much. And uh, I guess on behalf of all of us here uh, at the festival, first of all, we'd like to invite you both back to Vancouver in person when you're able to do that again, when you fancy a trip back to Vancouver, uh, let's do this again. And uh, in the meantime, Marlon, thank you for joining us. I know you're on an extensive tour for Moon Witch Spider King now. We hope that goes well and we're really grateful for your time today. And uh, thank Thanks for joining the Vancouver Writers Fest again, both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.